Good morning, everyone. Just a couple of minutes to 8.30, but I thought I'd start now. <laughs> um, I'm glad to be here this morning to share the Word of God that has stood out for me personally. So this morning, I'm going to take you back to our lesson in Jeremiah 31, when Pastor Charlie was here and uh, when he taught us on the New Sunday. I'm just going to read um, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I wonder if you like the word new in this verse. You know, I was trying to understand how Jeremiah actually felt when the Lord revealed this to him. I will make a new covenant. Wow. You know, and he must be thinking, well, what happens to the old one then? You know, I thought Jeremiah might have let out a big sigh for all the things he went through. Yes, you know, there is new hope when he heard that the Lord had said to him. Or perhaps Jeremiah had said, had, had think to himself, why would God even do that? You know, to, to these people who have turned away from him again and again, why would God be so gracious that he would give a new covenant and take away the old covenant? And when they, will they appreciate the word new when they didn't appreciate the old one? You know, I can't help but ask myself if I appreciate the word new. You know, this brings me back to my testimony of faith, how the Lord graciously opened my heart and eyes to the scriptures. You know, there was a new in me. My life changed. I couldn't turn away from God anymore. I had to return to God. You know what, Jer what God said in Jeremiah um, in the same verse? He said, he, uh, no, in, in verse 33, sorry, he continued saying to Jeremiah, he said, I will put my law in their mind and write it on their heart. My past three years of being a Christian, getting to know God, he was putting his law in my heart and working in me. And that was what he said in that verse. And even when I wandered away from him for, you know, for so many years, life filled with everything but God. You know, God remember my sins no more. And even when he opened my heart and I still hesitated and struggled in trusting him, he brought me closer to him with everlasting love and loving kindness. You know, my God of all drew me to him. You know, this morning I'd like to remind myself and all of us that our God is indeed a gracious father. We have a God who would wants to choose not to remember our sins, but wants to show us grace instead. And He will give us a new that we can hope for, that we can be excited about. 24 years have passed for Bethel, but we have more to come. Let us not take this new for granted. Let's appreciate this new as a church. Let's look forward, but let God be the one to write His law in Bethel in our hearts. Today, um, I chose a hymn that I've never sang, be sang before. <laughs> I chose a hymn in hymn 415. Um, if you want, you can also open up, uh, use the hymnal, just so you know how the um, tune goes, if you can read the notes. But I like to, I really like the words um, in this hymnal, uh, in this hymn. 415, He giveth more grace. I'll read the first stanza and the chorus to you. He giveth more grace when the burden grows greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To edit affliction, he added his mercy. To multiply trials, he multiplied peace. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary, known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. And, I, and when, I read, when, I, when I look at the words here, I'm like, this is 
Jeremiah would be singing this. <laughs> you know, and what he, what, what the things that he experienced. And that's what God's love was. It was just grace. There was so much grace given to his people, no matter what happened. You know, that's what God wanted to do. And I, and I, um, let's try this song. Let's try the first stanza one round and, and see how we go. All right? Thank you very much. I'll pass the time to Pastor. Good. Well, I'm very glad to be back home. Just looking forward to uh, sharing and reading and pondering the Lord's Word with you this morning. Okay, well, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you. Truly, you have given grace upon grace. God, help us not just to receive, but help us to understand why grace is being given and what we are to do with it in our life. Now we ask that you would give to us that wisdom and understanding which we need to fathom, to ponder as we read your word together. Instruct us, we pray. Teach us your way, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, we're going to turn to... Uh, Thessalonians, again. Okay, and, and it's important that we learn to read the Scriptures properly all the time. Okay, the danger is to pick and choose what we like to read. That's always the danger. We feel troubled, we find, okay, is there a, a Bible verse? We have problems in our life, is, where's the answer? That is a great mistake. The danger is you lead yourself. And you want to, and you get frustrated when you can't find anything. Is that how we are to read the Lord's Word? The answer is obviously no. Now, even in listening to the Lord's Word, same problem. How we read reflect how we listen. Right? We can listen, okay, this is not relevant to me, we tune out. Oh, it doesn't speak to my heart. You see the danger? How do we read the Scriptures? And, and there are some very basic, important guidelines, actually. Okay? Really important guidelines. Do we believe the Scriptures in spite? Yes. Look, general knowledge, yes. Do we believe that the Scriptures is instructive for, for us? Yes. And we're talking general, right? Do we believe that the Scriptures grant to give to us wisdom? Yes. Question. How do we therefore read it? Okay? Now, we've got to take a look at it and understand why the author write what he did. Now, in the New Testament, we're reading, for example, the, the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul writes mainly directed to the church at large. Okay, you read Romans to the church in Rome. Right? Corinthians, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossia, Thessalonica to the church. Now, were there personal letters? Yes. To two particular individuals, well, a few actually, Philemon's one of them, but there is, was Timothy and then Titus, right? These were the personal letters. Okay, so you got to read it with, the, in, with understanding, why, okay, who was it writing to words? Important. Okay, so when we read it, we have to read it with reference to, okay, now this is with reference to the church. This is important. Now, what I'm reading, is it relevant to me? Yes, somewhere, somehow, because I belong to the church. I need to know how to understand the church. I need to know my part in the church. Now, this is all New Testament. Of course, the gospel is with reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Who He is, how to find faith in Him, what would He called us to do, and so and so forth. 
right? Ends with the Great Commission for all who are Christians. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> predominant Israel as a nation. Okay? So we cannot just, okay, I, I like to read this one. Or, or new, mix it up, and then it all applies to me. I don't think so. You'll make a big mistake if you do that. Chances of you reading it wrong, high. And when you read it wrong, apply it wrong, is it going to bring about blessing to your life? Of course not. Okay, so this is important. Why we have Sunday school is to allow ourselves to constantly, okay, now how do I read the scriptures properly, correctly? Rather than just look for quick fixes all the time. The danger is we want to look for quick fixes. Give me quick answers. God, speak to me, whatever. Doesn't work like that in life. Okay, we're going to see this in Davidic Psalms later on. Uh, but let's take this just to help us to get back and say, okay, now how do I read the Lord's Word? Okay, now whether it was Israel or the church, the emphasis is why is it relevant? Is it's beyond not just a church building. What is a church? It's not just a nation. The emphasis over here is do we understand what it means to belong to God as His people? Well, Wendy cited, uh, you know, the, uh, Jeremiah 31. Take a look at the Jeremiah 31 carefully. It is a reference. The covenant of God, a relationship, is not just personal, but is people. In there, my people, Right? So this is very, very crucial that we understand how do we understand this, what it means to be people of God. Well, let's, we are reading Thessalonian. Let's turn to Thessalonian. Okay? Now, take a look at chapter 4. Right? You're going to see this again and again to the church and then he will say, brethren, beloved brethren, right? Chapter 2, brethren, and he talks to them as brethren well. See, that's our identity. We are brethren in the Lord, right? We are brethren to faith in Christ. But beyond just saying, I am brethren, what are we doing here? Okay, now chapter 4, we read, Finally then, my brethren, there we go, we urge you and exhort you, right? Exhort, sorry, in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. Sure, abound in knowledge, abound in understanding, abound in faith, Abound in love. Abound in all these things. For what? Now, this is important. Just as you received from us how you ought to walk and please God. This is the most critical thing. How we are to walk in a way that pleases God. You see, this is the danger. A lot of the time, we think God exists to please us. My happiness is the most important thing. Right? It's as if that's what it is. God's existence, okay, I give you love, I give you grace, I give you mercy, so I can be happier. Right? And then the, the problems in life, God, why, why, why you got a problem? How come? As if God existed to please you. We've got a wrong way around. We have forgotten that actually, uh, it's us that is to please God, not God please us. Right? If we understand our relationship with God correctly. So why do we want to know the Lord's Word? That we may know how to walk. How do you know how to walk? 
we think, we assume we know. That's the danger. We assume we know what the church is all about. Oh, after all, I've been a Christian for many years. Really? Every single church was written to. Whether you are Rome, whether you are a gifted church like Corinth, whether Corinth literally thought they were on the right track until Paul wrote to them, what are you doing? They were so gifted. They were so rich. They, as it is. Why? It's called grace. Please do not think just because a church is highly gifted, all the things that are there, rich like anything, meaning great, don't equate the two together. It's out of grace. God gives. What you do with it is something else. The worst possible model of a church was Corinth. Two letters written, two letters of rebuke. What's wrong with you? How can you cover up sin? And today, churches cover up sin. I don't, don't talk about it. Leaders cover it up. And problems grew. Paul wrote to them very, very firmly, how can you allow for these things to happen? Is this pleasing God? Obviously not. Right? Everybody hush. Everybody on the outside, it looks so good, Corinthian church. You are such a promising church. On the inside, they were divided like anything. Oh yeah, I, I'm, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Apollos, I belong to uh, Paul. I, one group, you know what? I belong to Jesus. It's the Jesus group. You know, meaning, you see, you only apostles, you see, I am right up there. Ah, they were that divided. Right? They know how to speak the language. They know how to use the word grace. They know how to use the word wisdom. Anything in their life that reflected the both. There was no grace, no wisdom. This was the Corinthian church. And so Paul wrote to them very, very, very firmly. The Galatian church became very legalistic. <clears throat> right? Why are you going to go, you are, you are, why are you like this? Why are you not eating? Why you didn't wash your hand? Why are you going to do that? Why are you wearing this? Why are you didn't walk in a certain way? Ah, oh, can't breathe. They went back to legalism. They began with grace. Saved, yes. And then after a while, salvation. Oh, yeah, 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 you're saved, but you've got to do it my way. You've got to do it this way. You've got to do it that way. In fact, you've got to do it Moses' way. Oh. And they pride themselves for their meticulous following of the law until Paul wrote to them, what is up? See, every church has its problems. Okay, you mustn't think, no, no, no problem. Okay, all right, to be a church, we have to have no problem, eradicate problem. Every church has its issues. Please do not think the Philippi church has no issues. Or the church in Ephesus, the leading church in that region was Ephesus. Everything in terms of knowledge, Post teacher, this is a church post teacher dare not go because they're so knowledgeable in the scriptures. Remember, the most amount of time Paul spent was in Ephesus, three years teaching them. Seminary there. Wow, Paul's seminary, instructing them, leaders. In terms of knowledge, understanding, wisdom, nobody can hold a candle to them. Right? They were very, very firm in teaching the scriptures. One problem, they left their first love. So you have knowledge with no love. That's another problem, right? Okay, now, come to the church in Thessalonica. Paul did not spend a whole lot of time with them. But whatever they learned, they applied. This church loved the Lord. This church expressed love for one another. But it is also in grave danger because they lack knowledge. They lack understanding. The danger of false teachers coming in, very real. Okay, so, um, 
all the time. You see this. People will come and tell you, hey, this is a YouTube. This is a great prophet. This is a wonderful apostle. Wow, you got to listen to these words. The moment you hear these two words, prophet and apostle, ah, you'll be very, very concerned. Obviously. Right? And there will be. You, we've got to be, okay, now, do you know your stuff or not? Okay, so look at the dangers that are there. And the danger is the church can end up dishonoring the Lord. How do you walk? How does the church walk? Does the church walk? Yes. Of course, it's a metaphor. The church does not literally walk. Is walking with the Lord, is living, is right. This is how we do things that walk that pleases God. And so Paul writes to them and says, you know, this is brethren, right? And tells them, just as you have received, how abound, and that is our challenge, how you ought to walk to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord. Now, see, the Lord is there. We need to know the Lord's word. We need to know how do I walk in, in a way that really pleases God. I think that's the important emphasis. Right? Not the other way around, okay? Not God... Can you give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this. Then I'll be happy with you. Then I will, uh, then I will be very happy. God does not exist to please us. Don't live and practice faith like that. And this is an important reminder for all of us that how we ought that would please God. Now, chapter 4, and then all the way down, Paul uh, you know, exhorts how this works. Verse 3, sanctification. Now, we need this. We need the Lord's sanctification all the time. Right? What is sanctification? See? It is not doing it our own way. Well, I want to please God, but I want to do it my way. I want to do it. God, you never call me. What is my part? I want to do it. First word you need to learn is sanctification. How are we to be set apart by the Lord? How the Lord has to work in our heart, in our mind, right? Deeply until we truly are set apart. Vessels of honor, right? So this is an important work that God has to do. Your sanctification, right? Not our will. The will, of, this is the will of God. See, there's a difference between our own will and God's will. Big difference. I want to do it this way. No, this is what God, how God does it. Now, your sanctification. Number one, important, Right? Verse 4, each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Obviously. Let's begin with your life. See? All right? So we talk about the church. And the church, what do we want to do? That we may please God. Now, where does it begin? You. You. Your sanctification, the individual, right? Let's begin there. Let's begin with salvation. I come to faith in Jesus. It doesn't end there. Well, thank God, you know, I'm cleansed. Thank God, thank God for the blood of the Lamb. Thank God for Jesus Christ. That's wonderful, yes. But please don't end there. Sanctification, right? There we go. And there we see this. Your sanctification. Honor. Am I living in a way that would honor the Lord? Lord, you give me this grace. 
enable me. Whatever it is, well, I need to abound in this. So it's begin with the individual. The individual needs faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where you begin. Now, after I come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what next? Sanctification. This is the will of God. This is what pleases God. Okay, now, I've got to uh, understand this. Okay? Honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know the Lord. I obviously, my life has got to be different from before I knew the Lord. If my life, no difference. Right? If a non-believer curse and swear, I also curse and swear. They do whatever they want. I also do whatever I want. What's the difference? Is that sanctification? No. I live under a different set of code. I live not to please myself. I live to please the Lord. See how I ought to walk. How should I walk? I, I, to please the Lord. Right? Problems or no problems. It's not about problems. It is, how do I respond to this? Is it going to please the Lord? If it is about pleasing myself, then God, take away my problems. Why are you not taking away my problems? Why are there still so many problems? Then it is about you. It's about how God should please you. This was David's struggle. He could not understand why the problems were there, despite how many prayers he made, until he began to realize, hello, God is king not you. God is Lord, not you. You are to please the Lord, not the other way around. Get it right. You see this? So this is important that we understand that, right? Now, <clears throat> that no one should take advantage. Don't defraud, obviously, because the Lord is the avenger. He forewarned, right? Uh, we also forewarned you, testify, God does not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Now, this is vital. Okay? So we begin with personal, before we talk about the church, we, we need it to see it on a very, very personal level, salvation, sanctification, and then we uh, take a look at this. Okay? Now, he goes on to say, now let's take a look at um, chap uh, chapter 5 now. Okay? Concerning times, season, no need. And then he says, look, I uh, no need to say these things for you yourselves know perfectly. Now we see here this day called the day of the Lord. Right? And this is an important thing to understand. The day of the Lord. What shall we be doing? And so we read, uh, okay, like verse 9 again, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Right? And so, uh, though, whether we weak, uh, uh, wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Isn't it? And then we read, therefore comfort one another with these words. Right? We urge you, brethren, recognize those who labor among you. Right? And there we go. What should we be doing? If we understand the day of the Lord, ah, we should be truly people who are servants of the Lord. Diligent, faithful. You know, Lord, what is, what is my part? There will be a great sense of urgency. There will be a great sense of commitment to serve the Lord. Again, that we may please the Lord. Right? A servant, a good servant, does whatever he does to please the Master. See the understanding? You've got to move from salvation to understanding, wow, holiness to God to servanthood. You see this? Right? And a lot of time, people still hear, yeah, I'm safe. That's it. I have to do whatever I want. 
I don't understand holiness. I don't stand, understand pleasing the Lord. I don't understand. It's, okay, I'm a Christian now. Hooray, I'm saved. Oh, I feel so good about myself. Right? And then I can ask God for anything. Okay, God, okay, give me strength. Okay, do this for me. Do that for me. Move problems. Get rid of problems for me. How come you didn't answer my prayer? What are you doing? Right? I don't think we understand all these things here. Okay, so we've got to understand, right, that you, sometimes you have to tell me, go back to here, are you really saved or not? If you are, you've got a bit more sanity than that. Okay, and, and then, right, do we understand holiness? Be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. Now, we understand servanthood. So don't jump the gun. So we're not going to get all the, the, my 12.30 class, okay, now you're ready to serve the Lord. Of course they're not. They don't even understand what it means. Okay, bit by bit, do you know the Lord or not? All right, let's lead them. Bit by bit, come to know the Lord. Okay? I've heard of 13-year-old. Okay, now, now you're ready to speak. Go up there and teach Sunday school. Excuse me? Don't, don't jump the gun. Get your life in order. Right? How you live is vital sanctification. How you may honor the Lord and you truly reflect the Lord's holiness. Okay? I know, this, is this a struggle? Of course it is. At every level, we need the Lord's grace and mercy. At every single level. Right? He giveth more grace. This is a wonderful song to sing. But you've got to ask, what for? He giveth more grace. Now, grace is absolutely amazing. Grace is given as it is utilized that will enable you whatever it is. But if you are not going to do it, no grace is going to be given. What for? You're going to waste it. If you're not going to serve the Lord, that grace is not going to be given. If you're not going to seek to walk with the Lord, you're not going to seek that sanctification from God. That grace is not given. It is given when we seek it. Lord, I recognize I cannot be holy without you. Yes. I recognize I cannot serve you without your grace. Yes. Absolutely. You could not be saved without God, without Jesus, without grace. And a lot of time we try to save ourselves. Okay, I don't need, I, I, I can be good, I can be holy, I can be right. And when we recognize, we can't. However long you need to take to recognize, realize, we're going to be wasting time until we recognize, you know what, I, am, I, I need the Lord's grace. See, grace and peace begins. Yes. But for what? You've got to read the whole chapter. You've got to read, in fact, all the other epistles. And then recognize, hey, actually, similar principles are there. You're going to see salvation as vital, by grace, truly. You're going to see sanctification. Thank God for that grace. You're going to have, how do I serve the Lord? That it would please Him, not yourself. Well, grace. Right? Okay? Now, let's take a look at this. Okay? Recognize. Now, we need to recognize. All right? And then those who labor among you. Well, thank God for them. And, right, and they admonish you. This is a reference to the, to the leaders of the church. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Well, thank God for leaders who serve the Lord. Very, very, you know, they, they spare no effort. They really give of themselves. They are people who walk with the Lord. They are people sanctified. And this honor and recognition should be given. Now, look at this in verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren. Now, this is interesting. So there are the leaders, yes. But there are also those who are non-leaders. This is the community. Okay? It's not just leaders. Okay, you do all the work. We just cheer you on. Well done, well done. 
good job. There are those now. See, this is the difference. We exhort you, brethren. Okay? Leadership is not an, a, is something that should be highly regarded, you know, and challenging. It is not about position. Anyone who steps into leadership role must understand what leadership is. Our current governor general, Peter Crossgrove, is a leader. If you look at his life very, very carefully, from the army, military background, to the governor, to, to becoming a general of the army, to becoming the chief of army, right? To becoming the governor general is no, I read an article, why am I saying this? Is I read an article on him on the Australians recently. And he was interviewed. And I really appreciated what he said about leadership. It is not a day I do not live, think, breathe the responsibility that has been entrusted to me. Now, I absolutely agree with him. That's a leader. We never switch off. Okay? Just because I'm away, does it mean I switch off? I still answer emails. I still pray for the church. I still, that you live, breathe, sleep the responsibility given to you as a leader. There is no off. There's only on. You, can you take that kind of challenge? Can you understand that? If you do, you understand leadership. And then it's not something easy. And I agree with him on that part. Of course, an, a, a leader as he is. You see, we've got to understand this. Now, brethren, what about, not everybody is given the leadership role, but it doesn't mean less. It really doesn't. Each one of us that make up the church of God are given the sense of accountability and responsibility of the community we belong to. And this next part is special because, you know, what makes a church really strong? Sure, we talk about people coming to faith in Jesus. They, be, no, they, they are sanctified by the Lord. They are equipped to be servants of God. What makes a church truly spiritual and strong? The sense, the spirit of the community is there. Watch the spirit of the community. So the church spirit is up to the church. Develop it. All these things are there from the Lord. You develop the, you know, this is the spiritual part, this is the strength. What is, you want to put it this way, what is the spirit of the church? Sorry, right? The spirit of the church. What is the spirit of our church? Now, this is an interesting thing. Okay, the sense of community. Is it the spirit of the church? Is there a sense of community? Take a look at this. Okay, we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Now that is a spirit of a wonderful church. Okay? Now that was interesting. We were in uh, Launceston, and uh, we went to the farmer's market there just to see if we're any, any different from our farmer's market over here. Oh, it was smaller. And, uh, you know, okay, did I get anything? No, same. Olive oil there, olive oil here, right? Cheese here, cheese there. But what was different was I liked the sense of community. So uh, we were there, and then uh, look, I was just looking around. Well, uh, you know, the rest were shopping. I was with James. He was just interested to get a balloon. That's it and walking around. But what I saw was really interesting. 
Suddenly from nowhere, a gong rang and all the shop holders cheered. Go, yeah! I thought, wow, what grand final or something? Haven't happened yet. <laughs> right, well done. Wow, they were cheering for a, a store. So I asked the owner, what happened? See, every now and then, one of the, one of the store holders will win the amount of people going to their store. Well, they, I don't know how they tally these things. They will be voted for the best store for the week. Or, or, or the bath. I don't know when they will be voted for the best store. I say, are you serious? She won and everybody is cheering for her? That's, I don't see that in her. <laughs> when somebody does well, are you happy for them? Or you feel envy? Why, why, why you didn't cheer for me? Why you didn't mention my name? I also worked very hard. See the difference? I thought, wow, this is different. Maybe it's a small town. But, you know, those were the pleasant experiences that I had that really was an eye-opener. So, wow, everybody cheering for... Because your fellow storeholder won, they are genuinely happy for them. Wow, okay. So I was in this small little town. I went into IGA. This a small town called IGA. And then uh, I was asking the person, have you, you know, got this thing here? And they said, oh, sorry, I don't work here. Huh? How come you're stocking the shelves? I'm just helping out. What? <laughs> you don't work here? Yeah, I'm just helping the person out. I know him as a friend. Okay, you don't see that in Perth. So there was a hotel we stayed in, a very interesting hotel, one of the most unique hotels ever, because they had a dog there in the lobby. Labrador there, and we were told, this one is the chief concierge. Huh? And it was the hotel dog. The kids loved every day. The dog was called Achi. And so every morning, Achi goes for a walk with the kids. Very gentle dog. It was a guide, meant to be a guide dog to train for the blind. But this one was a bit too enthusiastic, so cannot. So, got downgraded. The dog, uh, the, sorry, the hotel adopted it and became the hotel dog. And it was a very patient dog. Even James can walk the dog. The dog is bigger than James. And he's just patiently walking James. I mean, the, the dog, <laughs> James was walking the dog. But, you know, it appeared the other way around. Absolutely amazing. So there was the, you know, the people, the staff there. So, on the day we were about to leave, we wanted to walk the dog again. And hey, hey the staff is not in uniform. So how come you're doing here? Oh, it's my day off. Your day off, you come to work. Yeah, to walk the dog. Wow. He's serious. Who goes to work on their day off? He does. Like nothing. They really have a sense of community here. This is there. Now, the one that really gripped me was this. We were in um, this place called Stanley. This is a real top, really the Top, top, top corner of uh, Tassie. And there was a little cafe. We were you know, driving there, went to do the sightseeing. And then we just stopped by this cafe. Right? Uh, you know, coffee, just uh, go to the toilet. And then the lady was there, very nice person. So I asked her, what is this? She had all over the place, never give up. What is that? Well, you're all over the place. Never give up. And so she was telling me, oh, this is a charity that she set up many years ago when her husband had fighting cancer. And so they set up all the proceeds goes towards the charity in remembrance of the late husband. Every year they have this. N not only the proceeds from her own shop, but they have a bike ride. This community, this small little town, I don't know how many, maybe a few hundred people. Anyone that has battling cancer, this charity will help. It doesn't matter who you are. This community, because it's so rural, they, you need to be sent to the big town. You need money. He said, we knew how hard it was. For 11 years, my husband had to go up and down 
chemotherapy. There was a lot of expenses. And so after he passed away, we set up a charity called Never Give Up. We're there with you. We're there for you. You're not in this alone. We're going to back you up. Why? You belong to this community. Oh, I thought I was like, wow, really? Is this not what a church meant to be? It is more than just, okay, I come to worship. Hi, everyone. Very nice to see you again. Bye. And off we go. You can do that every week. And a relationship is no deeper. You can have very superficial relationship. Or you can have a deep community spirit. Look at this. Take a look at this yourself. Right? Comfort the faint-hearted. See, there are those who can be discouraged. Do we know how to comfort? See, what are servants of God? Servants of God learn to comfort the faint-hearted. We learn to be by people's side, not tell people, hey, hey, you're not living according to the Bible, you know. We're very good at pointing sins out. You see, 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 see. wow. Are you comforted now? Uh, not really. When people are really in distress, what do you do? The best thing Jesus did was just to be there. Tears flowed. He was just there. Did he recite the commandments? of? There's a time for words. There's a time to be there. There's a time when comfort is needed. The faint-hearted is that of just distress. There are many problems in life, and it could hit at any time. And so I see this lady, I say, wow, you, you suffered this. I say, wow, I, I'm thankful that I, I have a shop. You know, I can uh, support myself. I could support my husband. I've supported the kids. And she said, I'm the fifth generation of this, this shop. I say, what? They really have a strong community spirit. See, unfortunately, this is only country folks have this. The city folks is there for the moment. What's in it for me? What's in it for me in this job? What can I get out of it? If it's, you're not giving me enough, off I go. This is the attitude of society today. It's dollars and cents. It's, what, what can I get out of this? And I just move. We've become superficial, we become shallow, we become self-centered and selfish. And we bring it all into the church. What does the church reflect? That. Is it meant to reflect that? No. It was meant to reflect Christ. It was meant to reflect our Savior. It was meant to reflect our Lord. It was meant to reflect, this is God's people, yes! See, this is what it reflect. Look, comfort the faith, uphold the weak. Those who are weaker in their faith, be there to scaffold them, uphold them, encourage them, that they may know, well, you know what? I can, yes, you can. Never give up. They're taking, this is the principles of the scriptures. Sometimes all we know is how to give people Bible verses, but we don't tell them. We don't not just say, see, he didn't say, say all these things to them. No, uphold them. How do we uphold them? I pray for you. Are you upholding them? Not really. Telling somebody you are praying for them does not mean you are upholding them. Upholding someone requires strength. It is it good to pray for people? Of course it is. But be there to uphold. This is community spirit. See this? Be patient <laughs> with all. Yes, be patient with all. There are those who are weaker in their faith. They will say wrong things. They will not live. Hey, how are you doing that? Be patient with all. As the Lord has been so patient with you, learn to be patient. So do I practice patience? Yes. 
for myself. Why, Lord, thank you. Okay, I practice patience. And you know how impatient you are. Come on. Wow. Stop yourself. Hang on. Has not the Lord been patient with you? And you practice. It is not easy to be patient. We have very high expectation for other people. Hey. Why, you should be doing this, 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 this. How come you're not doing it? Be patient with all. Okay. Has the Lord not been patient with you? Yes, He has. Okay, learn to be patient. This is what practicing spirit of the church is. What do we do? Learn to be patient with all. Right? But the person is not walking in this, the Lord's way. You think the Lord didn't know that? No need. <laughs> all right, let's learn again. All right, okay. Can, can I encourage you? Can I uphold you? Can I comfort you? The person's discouraged. But the person is, is angry. Be patient with all. Okay, when we're angry, we say all kinds of crazy things. Learn to be patient with all. Wow, look at this. I, this is a wonderful community spirit. Okay? See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. In other words, retaliation. Wow, you know, the person did this to me. I'm going to do it back. Wow. So easy. Right? Okay? Wow, see, this one doesn't like me very much. When I come to line up for lunch, they give me a small chicken wing. And then only a little bit. Next week when I'm serving, you watch. I give you one rice. <laughs> Don't render evil for evil. <laughs> right? No need to. Can we be patient with all? Because see, this one is so much. Wow, be patient with all. This one, oh, see, we just anger ourselves to death. You suffer a heart attack. Not because God sent it, because you send yourself into one. Learn to be patient with all. Right? Look at this. These are really words of wisdom over here. Okay? Now, this is what you want to do. Don't render evil. Right, don't do that. Now, what do you want to do? Always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. What's good for you? Ha! Huh. Pursue it for all. You know how to look for the things good for you, right? I hope so. Right? This is good for me. This encourages me. Can I, can I share this with you too? I want to pursue this for all. Can I do that? No. It's up to us to build up the spirit of Bethel. This is sure. Salvation is from the Lord. Yes, grace. 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 Now, what do we do with these people? Thank God for people who serve the Lord. Learn to give thanks. Well, what do we do with the people who come and some are weaker and some are dis very discouraging people? Some are people who oh, really frustrate me. You know, practice this. Be patient with all. <sighs> do good. Don't render evil. Huh? Very important. Okay? Be there for them. Be there to encourage. Be there to uphold. Be there. There's the faint-hearted. Can I comfort? The word comfort, very closely related to the word encourage. Can I encourage? That will be wonderful. Then we will build up the church spirit, a community spirit that would please the Lord. How do we ought to walk? Well, let's be a church that will please the Lord. Let's be a church that would really bring joy and honor to the name of the Lord. Why? Well, because we are God's people. Okay? Well, that would be wonderful. I mean, people who are on the outside and they understand community, the church. How much more? Once upon a time, the church understood this. Today, you, you, you really wonder why. Well, let's go back to the Scriptures. Let's go back to the Lord's Word. Let's go back to this. Okay? Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we pray that our hearts would be greatly challenged.
you have really granted to us, given to us, blessed us with your grace in salvation, in sanctification, in serving. Lord, help us to build your church, to, be, to, to have a wonderful spirit, the church spirit that would reflect your grace and love, that we will be there for each other, we'll be there to encourage, we will be there to be patient. Give to us also this grace, for we cannot do this ourselves. We tend to be frustrated and irritated with each other, and we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us and help us once again for your glory, for the name of the Lord, that you would teach us what Jesus said to his disciples, love one another. By this, all men will know we are truly your disciples. We ask that you would hear this, our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, let's look forward to doing this build up the spirit of the church. Okay?